okay? So welcome everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, whatever you are in the world. Today we are going to talk about something very, very special. It's about uh, genetics on our cardiac patients. We have a very nice uh, 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 experts here to talk to us. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be very, very important to all of us to understand better our patients. So just before we start, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, our academy and the activities that we're planning for the next uh, couple of weeks. So uh, we invite all of you for our big uh, sessions for the big webinars that we have, the master classes every Thursday at 3 p.m. Rome time. So exactly this time, whatever you are in the world. So uh, this next Thursday is going to be cardiac anesthesia. The next one, ECMO part one. The next one, interventions. And the next one, we are going to continue the TGA talk that we had last week. And then uh, again, uh, the second part of ECMO. If you uh, were not able to see TJ part one, it was amazing, as well as a heterotaxy syndrome uh, a webinar and uh, the hypoplastic left heart syndrome webinar. They are all on our YouTube channel. We invite you, all of you, to take your time and, and take a look. We have other activities as well. On June the 15th, next Monday, Dr. Silvermine is going to have a very interesting classroom about uh, the relationship of the morphology and the images for the truncus uh, pathology. So it's going to be very interesting. He has amazing images. And then on the 16th, we are going to have a multicentric uh, CICU response for COVID that is chaired by uh, Children's National in Washington, D.C. And we are going to be happy to, if uh, all of you can attend as well, it has been very nice, uh, this collaboration of all the CICUs. And the uh, next uh, Friday, we have a classroom of Dr. Oh. who is going to talk about morphology of uh, AST. So just to reinforce uh, our next uh, uh, activity after this one is going to be the cardiac anesthesia. This is important for you to know that it's not only for anesthesiologists, all the multidisciplinary team is uh, welcome and invited to join us on this activity. And this is about uh, the doctor's uh, Silverman uh, classroom. It's going to be very, very nice. The multicentric uh, CICU response uh, for COVID that uh, is going to be very interesting uh, as well. It's going to be on the 16th. And uh, if you think this is a nice thing that we are doing and you want to uh, get closer to us, especially if your country is not uh, already highlighted in red, please send us an email. We want uh, to uh, have delegates from all over the world that do help us to uh, spread the news and uh, to get uh, the information, whatever uh, it's needed. So today we are going to talk about uh, cardiogenetics and this is very nice uh, to know that uh, as uh, everybody was, a lot of people were interested in this uh, subject, we are planning to have a uh, cardiogenetics part two soon and we will not let you know. Follow us on social media, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn so you're going to get information about all the events and activities that we are planning. So for now, thank you very much again. And I want to introduce uh, Dr. Daniela Poli. Uh, she is a pediatric cardiologist in uh, Bambino Gesù of Taormina, and she's responsible for the step down unit. Uh, she's going to be our moderator of the session. Thank you very much, everybody. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm very proud to present this interesting webinar on clinical cardiogenetics myths and truths. Our understanding of the role of genetics in the pathogenesis of congenital heart diseases has uh, advanced at a rapid pace over the past 10 to 15 years. The availability of new molecular techniques has facilitated gene discoveries uh, that have changed the medical and cardiological care of many individuals with congenital heart diseases. Okay. Car Cardiovascular genetics. So uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, wherever you are in the world. Today we are going to talk about something very, very special. It's about uh, genetics on our cardiac patients. We have a very nice uh, 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 experts here to talk to us, and uh, I'm sure this is going to be very, very important to all of us to understand better our patients. <laughs> 
So just before we start, I should talk a little bit about uh, our academy and the activities that we're planning for the next uh, couple of weeks. So uh, we invite all of you for our big uh, session <laughs> for the I don't know why it's happening to them. No idea. Thursday at 3 p.m. room time. It's a, a loop of the audio that happened on the other uh, meeting. So now it stopped. Good. Uh, I'm sorry. The next one, ECMO part one. The next one, interventions. And the next one, we are going to continue the TGA talk that we had last week. And then uh, again, uh, the second part of ECMO. If you uh, were not able to see TJ part one, it was amazing, mm -hmm. as well as an heterotaxy syndrome uh, a webinar yeah, and uh, the hypoplastic left heart syndrome webinar. They are all okay, on our YouTube. Okay. Okay. Cardiovascular genetics clinics are now available in many major medical centers in the United States. Accurate diagnosis of congenital heart diseases, pathogenesis is allowing for determination of familiar reoccurrence risks, providing uh, reproductive options, identifying extracardiac manifestation of the genetic diagnosis that could affect the clinical care and improving long-term medical uh, decision in the care of congenital heart diseases. Now the presentation will be started by Dr. Baban, Cardiogenetic Service, Medical and uh, Surgical Department of Pediatric Cardiology, Bambino Gesù Hospital and the Research Institute. Okay. Well, hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Okay. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I would like to thank first the organizers, Grace, uh, Sasha, and uh, Daniela for, for giving us the chance for, to, to, to present part of our work. We are very happy with this experience. Um, so I'm going just to check. So I'm going just to, um, to try to give some information that are most useful is called for clinicians and um, there's nothing to disclose. So, rare disease patients face common problems. Why? Because often we have a lack for the correct diagnosis. I mean, in this case, for congenital heart defects, the comprehensive diagnosis, the multi-organ diagnosis, and often there is a delay in diagnosis and the quality of information often it is also lacking or it is a uh, few. And lack of scientific knowledge. And uh, of course, in that case, there will be heavy social consequences for patients. In addition, uh, unfortunately, uh, often we find some inequalities and difficulties in access to treatment and care. So uh, one of the main problems is that patients with uh, rare diseases, they have a delay in the diagnosis. And sometimes the time can be even not months, but sometimes years also, when they, when, until you can find the diagnosis. For example, in DMD patients, or even in, in patients with brother willy syndrome, there might be years or even uh, months or years until you get the diagnosis. In this uh, map, there's a, a, a very particular information because here you can see the percentage of rare diseases that get diagnosed by the parents of the patient or by the, um, the relatives of the patient, because in that case, patients, they go to um, local health or to a pediatrician and then they, go, they don't get the diagnosis. And then one of the parents, they go, they go and study and they make the diagnosis for their children. So it's not so easy for rare diseases to get diagnosed. And for rare diseases, there are different patterns of known, different patterns of inheritance. It can be an autosomal dominant, where the affected person can pass the disease in 50%. It can be mitochondrial. It can be X-linked, or it can be a recessive, or it can be simply sporadic. So when we talk about rare cardiac diseases, it can be it, it can be subclassified into major groups: inherited cardiac diseases, congenital heart defects and other rare forms. The inherited cardiac diseases are the cardiomyopathies, electrical diseases, mainly included in the European Reference Network, and hopefully in the, in the coming call, the congenital heart defects will be taken into consideration both for children and both for Gooch. Uh, 
Now we're going to talk about the congenital heart diseases. And please, for the surgeons, don't be freaked out uh, with this, um, with this, uh, with, with this uh, picture, because uh, you can notice that the heart is, is formed from, uh, fr fr from the interaction of many factors that can be from many genes, that can be transcription factors, they can be sarcomeric genes. And so it's not so easy and linear always to make the diagnosis. But just to get the idea, what we need in a first glance when we see a patient with a congenital heart disease, we need to, to understand if this is an isolated or a syndrome case. Is this a sporadic or a familial condition? Hopefully the majority of uh, congenital heart diseases, they are uh, isolated. However, this depends on which part of the world we are seeing the patients because for example, high in breeding or consanguinity, they can increase the complex forms. The syndromic patients, uh, they represent almost one third of these patients and there are more, there are more than uh, hundreds of uh, different diagnoses and syndromes. Sometimes we get the hint, sometimes it's the heart that helps uh, us to make the diagnosis. For example, um, we know very well what, when, when, when we see a patient with a pulmonary stenosis, especially with a supravalvular pulmonary stenosis, we think of Noonan syndrome. When, when we see left-sided uh, lesions, we think of Turner or Kabuki. When we see patients with tetralogy of Fallot or Trancas or interruption of the aortic arch, we think of microdeletion of 22. And we, when we see the canal, the atrioventricular canal, we think of Down syndrome or Alzheimer's Revel. So sometimes the heart helps us, the type of the congenital heart defects, it helps us to make the diagnosis. And why is it important? Because 10% of all pediatric mortalities are due to congenital heart defects. And 50% of death, secondary to malformations, are due to congenital heart defects. And it has still, still has a relatively high frequency. So the causes can be genetic causes, or it can be non-genetic ones. And never to forget the multifactorial. The multifactorial means that we have different genetic factors that can interact with environmental factors to cause the phenotype. And um, in the last years, it's always more and more emerging the effect of epigenetics that needs maybe another, just, um, uh, another presentation just to start and try to explain what we know about it. So here I'm going just to talk about the, uh, I'll start with the chromosomal defects that we see in patients, uh, in the patients that has congenital heart defects. Uh, those with trisomy 21, uh, trisomy 18, and trisomy 13. And in Down syndrome, I'm going just to bring for you our uh, recent experience for the differences in mortality and morbidity in Down syndrome that are related to the type of the congenital heart defects. Our experience on more than 500 patients that we have seen that uh, the most common uh, is, the is the atrioventricular septal defects, and these are the uh, typical, we have called them the typical congenital heart defects, and they were not different from that reported in literature. But then we needed just to analyze what is often gets uh, in, a second, in a second stage, and let's say that's considered less important in Down syndrome, which is the atypical congenital heart defects. And mainly we have analyzed those patients with univentricular physiology in terms of survival. And we have identified that patients, uh, the mortality of patients with Down syndrome and with typical congenital heart defects, they are mainly non-cardiac deaths. They are caused by cerebral hemorrhage or infections. While patients with atypical congenital heart defects, those with univentricular physiology, Down syndrome with univentricular physiology is the main cause of death and it is cardiac deaths. Moreover, we have identified that patients with the congenital heart defects that are typical for Down syndrome, they have much better survival, while those with atypical ones, they have, um, have less chance for survival, reaching 84% at a distance of 40 years. So we analyzed the literature for this, the univentricular palliation in Down syndrome, it's very controversial subject in literature. And uh, many reports in literature are against doing it, mainly because uh, 
Patients with Down syndrome, they can have more complications due to hypotonia, big tongue, and also to elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. The only report in literature that says there are no significant differences between Down and non-Down syndrome in facing the Fontan is only in one report. While all other reports say, if you need just to manage a univentricular physiology in Down syndrome, maybe you have just to look for, to try for biventricular correction or biventricular conversion. Another aspect which is very important maybe for the surgeons to know that the risk factors for patients with trisomy 21 is the low cardiac output syndrome and the multiple ventricular septal defect and the high vasectomy entropic score. These are the major risk factors for delay also in extubation and in um, favorable outcome. If we go and see other chromosomopathies, there are many and many that can be associated with congenital heart defects. One of the um, frequent scenarios that we see is the females with left-sided lesions with Turner syndrome. Since patients with Turner syndrome, they have congenital heart defects in 23% of them, mainly left-sided lesions with bicuspid aortic valve proctation or uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. One of the progressive nature of the Turner syndrome not to forget for, uh, for clinicians is the late hypertension. When we go deeper in the um, cryptic, let's say, chromosomal abnormalities, we found the classic uh, microdeletion of 22Q11, the velocardiofacial or d syndrome. I'm just going to tell you uh, our friend Jada that um, I, I have seen her in my first years in Bambino Gesù when I was a, a doctor of the pediatric cardiology ward. And it is, a, and, and, she, and Jada, she was born in 2007 and she was, and she is affected by pulmonary atresia, ventricular septal defect and the collaterals, MAPCAS. And the surgeon gave the note of absent thymus and the post-operative complications were pneumonia, hypercalcemia, feeding difficulties. I believe this scenario it gets repeated with patients with microdeletion of 22Q11. But it's important also to remember that the phenotype changes in these patients. And when we see uh, young uh, infants or children, the phenotype in the adult is, is really changing. And uh, this uh, condition is uh, relatively uh, frequent in the general population if we consider it, it's one over 4,000. And the congenital heart defect is reported in 74%. And it has a multi-organ uh, involvement in a very variable um, percentage. And we try to do our best always when we get the new diagnosis of patient to um, to, to get the referral to uh, practical guidelines for managing these patients. Since we know that these patients, they can have immunologic, uh, immunologic complications, they need uh, specific also uh, pre-operative preparations. And uh, other um, interesting information for the surgeon that we know these patients, they are predisposed to have aspiration pneumonia or repeated intubation. It can lead also to problems in the airways since they are already having uh, problems in the upper airways. Another emerging aspect that can be of help for uh, those who are uh, dealing with Gooch is the psychiatric complication in patients with microdeletion 22. When we go and see the um, percentage of the uh, congenital heart defects, as, as we have said, it is something like uh, um, 75%. And the most frequent one is the tetralogy follow. But, on the other hand, if we are get called to an intensive care unit and the diagnosis is the interruption of the aortic arch, one of the uh, first diagnoses that we, that we must exclude is the frequency of 22Q11 deletion since it can reach to 80%. Another uh, emerging aspect that, that's getting um, also reported in the literature is the progressive nature of uh, uh, certain defects such as the aortic root dilatation in patients with microdeletion 22. Um, a report in 2017 um, gives the information that the hospital mortality in patients with other genetic syndromes is um, in other genetic syndromes 
versus non-genetic syndromes, it is higher. But if we can see it compared to 22Q11, it is almost similar to those with patients with non-genetic syndromes. And the same thing, uh, if we can notice that patients with uh, genetic syndromes, other than the 22Q1 deletion, they need the ECMO or unplanned reoperation. On the other hand, the length for the stay, uh, for the post-operative stay and, and staying in intensive care unit for patients with micro deletion 22Q is higher than those for patients that they don't have any um, syndromic condition. Hopefully, the survival, if, um, it is almost similar to those for patients with uh, no uh, genetic con background genetic condition or genetic syndrome. Another condition that I would like to share with you is, um, is also a microdeletion syndrome, another microdeletion syndrome that is often characterized by feeding difficulties, failure to thrive, uh, reflux, prolonged colic, and um, other problems in the first year of lives include chronic otitis media, rectal prolapse, or hernias. In this patient, we see pulmonary artery stenosis, hypotonia, and hyperextensible joints, and it is the Williams syndrome. The Williams syndrome, this is a rare condition, one over 20,000, 50,000, and it's caused by microdeletion of the long arm of chromosome 7, including the elastin gene. And also these patients, they need multidisciplinary evaluation and it must be periodic with time since their problems change with time. Here as well, the congenital heart defects are found in 75% of patients and previously part of our group have described that the most frequent one is the supravalvular aortic stenosis and then the pulmonary stenosis. However, a more rare forms are also reported. The supravalvular aortic stenosis, it has really a very specific shape and specific characteristics, and it is a report in patients with Williams syndrome. From our experience, if one patient has a negative uh, fish exam for the microdeletion of Williams syndrome, uh, and has this specific phenotype, we test also for the elastin gene, and we have identified a few families that they are positive for this condition. The natural history for this condition in Williams syndrome depends on the severity of the lesion at presentation. Another condition is the pulmonary artery stenosis in Williams syndrome, and it's common to see in the first year of life. And um, it usually improves in the first few months of life. Other uh, stenosis, they can include coronary artery abnormalities or of the thoracic aorta, but we must know that the elastin is the gene that is very predominant in the arteries, so any artery can be affected of, in the body of the patients with Williams syndrome. That's why we highly recommend that when there's a new diagnosis of patients with Williams syndrome, and especially if they must face a surgical operation is to do the imaging of the head and neck vessels cis, in order to exclude any, uh, any involvement of these uh, vessels. Another uh, progressive nature is the predisposition to hypertension, of course. So um, chromosomal anomalies in syndrome with congenital heart defects, we see often down syndrome, turn and micro deletion, but this is only the point of an iceberg. But we, in our daily activities, we often face also some rarer forms where we don't have guidelines and we have to study each case in, a, in, in an individualized matter. Since any region of the chromosome can be involved leading to, cro to chromosomal uh, congenital heart effects. Then I'm going just to bring uh, an example from the monogenic diseases that are uh, the most frequent ones with the congenital heart defects, which is the Noonan syndrome and clinically related rasopathies. This is a re relatively frequent condition in the general population. And sometimes we identify a parent, a mother or a father that has the full phenotype, I mean phenotypic phenotype, without a congenital heart disease, and we make the diagnosis after the diagnosis of a child with a congenital heart disease. And there are many genes that can be called, that can cause the Noonan syndrome. And 
um, it has a characteristic species. However, the, the, the face of these patients can be very variable, short to stature in certain forms of Nolan syndrome, not in all of them. One of the interesting uh, conditions for the surgeons is the coagulation defect that can arrive up to 33%. So this is one of the screenings that we do preoperatively for patients with Nolan syndrome. The differential diagnosis for neural syndrome is the Leopard, uh, CFC, mutations by shock 2 or Costello. The congenital heart defect in this condition is more than 50%. However, an ECG abnormality can be even documented up in 90% if it is seen by a person who can read well the ECG in these children. The genotype-phenotype correlation in Nuna syndrome is not so easy, especially for the very recent forms that are described in the, re in the last few years. But in a general manner, we know that in Nuna syndrome, we see more pulmonary stenosis than septal defects. While in Costello, we see more cardiomyopathy compared to pulmonary stenosis. However, we know that there is a very high variability in action in our group. We have described several patients with atrioventricular canal in resopathies. And as well, sometimes we call one of these genes of the Noonan that is, is characteristic of the congenital heart defects, but it's not always like that because sometimes the same gene can cause also cardiomyopathies. Another difficult aspect for a clinician is the clinical diagnosis for children with resopathies in the first year of life. Actually, in most of these cases, the heart is the um, is the spy, is the, is the one, is, is the part of the clinical data that can help us to make the diagnosis in this group of patients. I just would like to share with you this, um, this study that has been performed by part of our group, where we have, uh, uh, where it has been described that the cardiac defects uh, has been found in 80% uh, of, the, of the cases in Noonan syndrome. And the cumulative survival, it was, it was really good. It was 94% in 20 years. And the risk for intervention was higher in individuals with Noonan syndrome and pulmonary stenosis, especially those positive for PTP and 11 mutations. Another aspect is that we analyzed in that, uh, in, in that study the mortality. And the mortality was relatively low. But specific association was related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, biventricular articular tract obstructions, and PTPN11 mutations. Now I'm just going to tell you about one condition that maybe that was discussed in a more detailed way in, in the last webinar about the uh, heterotaxy. The, the, ma the majority of patients with, the, um, with heterotaxy and they have unknown genetic background. However, there are several genes that they are now uh, emerging, especially with the NGS technique that I'm not going to discuss here. But my main interest is that uh, is the importance of multidisciplinary management of patients with heterotaxy. We know that um, we think that we are uh, perfect, but it is not like that because the laterality and the imperfection or the asymmetry is part of our perfection, let's say. So in patients with uh, right arterial isomerism, we have two, two right arterium. And that case we can imagine, we don't have left arterium. And so in that case, the pulmonary arteries, they get lost in, a, in, in a simple ways. And the, one of the most frequent uh, malformations that we see is the anomalous pulmonary venous return. While in uh, left arterial isomerism, we see two left atrium. And in that case, we can imagine that we have a defect in the main uh, battery of the heart or in the conduction system. And actually, in, in a study with, that we have performed uh, analyzing the long-term survival and the phenotype in uh, heterotaxy, we have identified that uh, from the multivariate analysis that left atrial isomerism is an independent predictor for pacemaker implantation. Another aspect that we have analyzed in these patients, because it's often misleading to call right atrial isomerism as asplenia, 
or left atrial azimalism as polysplenia. And actually, in our cohort, we have identified, and, and the same also from different literature revision, uh, that the asplenia is present in the right atrial azimalism in half of the patients, while polysplenia it was in 32%. And left atrial azimalism, there was uh, polysplenia in 64%. And there was a normal spleen in 16%. So it's really um, variable, and each patient needs to be evalu evaluated individually. Uh, regarding the long term survival of freedom from heart transplant, uh, it reached 70% for the right atrial isomerism and 87% for the left atrial isomerism. And here we plotted the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves for the uh, previous known studies. Um, and we compared it to our cohort. And we have identified a significantly lower mortality compared to all the studies. Mm -hmm. This is probably because of uh, experience techniques in surgical, um, in, in, in surgical um, competence or even the, uh, the improvement in ICU management, as well as the very important part is the immunological surveillance in these patients. And actually, we have reported that uh, in, in one study that early treatment and a prophylactic antibiotic and specific immunization program, it can reduce the mortality in asplenic patients with heterotaxy. Here, I would like just to bring you very few examples, because sometimes we think that the congenital heart defects is just a world that is detached from the rest of the inherited cardiac diseases, but it is not like that always, because sometimes there are mixed phenotypes with congenital heart defects. For example, I'm just going to bring you the example of patients with cardiomyopathies having congenital heart defects, because we know that Cardiomyopathies in children is a rare disease. And since it is a rare disease, so it needs a particular uh, attention. And we know that different cardiomyopathies can be caused by different genes. So the impact of genetics and clinics in cardiomyopathies and with the overlap of congenital heart disease, I'm just going to bring you the example of a patient that she was diagnosed at birth with arterial septal defect. Left ventricle no compaction at the beginning it was without any dysfunction and multivalvular dysplasia with mild dysmorphic feature and she's from the um, Gypsy Roma origin ancestor. We did many investigations including the metabolic investigation and they were negative and with time she developed ventricular dysfunction and dilated cardiomyopathy reaching to an ejection fraction of 30%. The ECG showed both Parkinson white. And when we did genetic investigations, we identified TMAN70 mutation. So what's the impact on these diagnoses for these patients? Because we know that when we diagnose patients with metabolic diseases, we have just to check if this is eligible for heart transplant or not. And we know in that case, there is the importance of a specific ICU precaution precautions and prevention of complications. And uh, sometimes we see that the patient is ill, but we don't understand why they are ill. And because there is a metabolic decompensation that if you don't go and look for, you can't help your patients. Another example is the, um, of the interaction of the cardiomyopathies with congenital heart defects is the predictive value according to specific genetic uh, conditions. So it's a genotype, phenotype, and management correlation. So our patient, we have uh, seen him few, um, something like five years ago. Uh, he was born with the aortic correctation, bicuspid aortic valve, mitral cleft. He had the surgical intervention. He had some orthopedic issues and epilepsy. And then we checked for the family history. The grandfather had pacemaker and heart transplant. The mother of the grandfather had a sudden death at 40 years old. And when we checked at that time, five years ago, we used to do the panels, but now we do the clinical exomes directly. When we checked for the panels, we identified laminae mutation. And when we 
send the mother to an adult center, she had a 40% ejection fraction and she received an ICD after that evaluation. And so they said, well, this is a coincidence. The aortic rotation with the laminae has nothing to do. But then we checked our cohort and we have analyzed six patients and we have identified that we have another patient with aortic rotation and we have one patient with repaired VSD and one patient with the dilatation of the aortic root. So there might be some mixing, there might be other factors, other genetic factors that we are unable to identify. But however, sometimes it's important to have some kind of, uh, we call it brain elasticity. Also because making a diagnosis of laminae changes the, changes the management of these, of these patients. Since we know that there are certain European Society of, Card of, European Society of Cardiology guidelines that uh, the management of patients uh, with lamin A is a bit different than those without a genetic background. I'm, doing, I'm going just to bring you the, uh, the example of one condition, a liquidical condition, let's call it, with mixed phenotypes with congenital heart defects. It is regarding the TBX5 mutations. Because previously, this gene was reported to be a causative for Holt Oram syndrome, giving the uh, main phenotype of upper limb defects. Congenital heart defects, mainly septal defects, and less frequently complex heart defects, and conduction defects, bradyarrhythmias. However, recently there are multiple evidences that they are reflecting a potential role of this gene on dilated cardiomyopathies and tachyarrhythmias, and not only on bradyarrhythmias. Actually, there is a very interesting recent study. So, when we see patients with uh, a genetic condition, that's caused by specific genes, we just have to take also in consideration the progressive nature of these uh, diseases. So it's not a static condition, but it's rather a dynamic one. So in conclusion, the congenital heart defects, they are highly heterogeneous. And the cardiogenic evaluation, it can help in establishing diagnosis, but as well in focusing on multi-organ work for these patients and multidisciplinary management. And congenital heart defects can be caused by almost any genomic regions. And some, uh, some conditions can be reported really in a very rare way. And it's very important that we must not forget that rare CHD phenocopies, they do exist even in daily practice in our tertiary care centers. This is our main branches that we see in our uh, cardiogenetic clinic, the congenital heart defects, the major part, cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias, and aortopathies. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to talk about you. We have very interesting examples of aortopathies, but I'm afraid that I'm running out of time. So around the child with congenital heart defects, we need the pediatric cardiologist, we need the cardiac surgeons, but we need also a lot of people around. So it's a matter of teamwork. Thank you. Thanks, Anwar, for the interesting and uh, very clear presentation. Um, Grace, uh, can you send uh, Paul? This is not mine. This is object. No, yes. it's not mine. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. Uh, may I uh, tell something? Yeah. Okay. Uh, regards to your uh, nice lecture, thank you very much. I would like to uh, say, uh, regards to my uh, experience, because uh, most of the time in the one of the P degree, we find many different penetrance of one phenotype yeah. in uh, family. It's very important because uh, the doctor or surgeon or pediatrician should be keep in mind maybe in some case uh, find ASD but the other case in other generation with same mutation uh, find VSD it's uh, so uh, we, we, we should be keep in mind the different trends with different phenotypes Maybe exactly. find in the one family one mutation. 
uh, on the other hand, uh, for the uh, sporadic uh, cases, most of the family ask the uh, genetic counselor or pediatrician, what about the next uh, children? What happened about that? We should know about uh, the sporadic case, the recurrent ri risk, it's uh, happened. Uh, it's uh, two to four uh, percent for every child. And uh, if the mother have a, this problem, has this problem, maybe the risk go up one to 10 uh, percent. Uh, and uh, I, I have a question because it's uh, my challenge in my country. Most of time in the fetal echocardiography or in the neonatal, uh, we find uh, some congenital heart disorder. Uh, most of the time, we don't uh, think about and we didn't find uh, any syndromic. So uh, how we uh, approach this by the geneticist? I try to do uh, the request for the CGH array because I think most of the, this type of problem depend to deletion or duplication. What's uh, your uh, suggestion about this issue? Well, if I, if I understood correctly, sorry, you, you were telling about the, um, the variability uh, within one family, that in one family you can see, it's just like that. We, we, call, we, we tell the patients sometimes um, that one gene is like the, the principal part of the tree, but this is a magic tree since it can give apples and pears or it can give apricots. So it's the same gene and can give variable ex ex expression. It can give different uh, types of uh, congenital heart defects. If I understood right, the first comment. Uh, the second thing that you were, if I understood correctly, uh, you were telling that um, most of these conditions um, it, well, actually, for the array CGH, uh, we uh, we do them, and um, it it can it can be of major help when you have complex patients. I mean, when you have patients with uh, multi-organ involvement, when you have the syndromic patients, it can give you more um, satisfaction. Well, those conditions with the isolated, sporadic, congenital heart defects, I don't know how much it can be of help. I believe, well, um, Elle and uh, Becca can uh, correct, can, can give me also some, uh, some help, but I believe that the percentage is less than 5% if it is an isolated and sporadic congenital heart defect, and you do the array CGH. Thank but you. How about how that can be of help. I, th I think that uh, the personalized medicine is, is the right word for these patients. Thank you, Anwar. Thank you very much. Now it's time to start with the uh, poll. Sorry. Okay. This is your poll. You yeah. yes. just in the just showing the, the results of the first question. So no, you don't mind. No, I know, no, I know. I'm going to give yours now. I think that's the your first one. Yes. Oh, Thank good. You. We won't have time, I think, for all of them, but uh, we can stick to one uh, question, and then in the end, if we have time, we can do more. Okay. So, so I should read them. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, in patients with uh, microdeletion of twenty two Q one one syndrome, they're all it's always associated with congenital heart defects. What do you think? Make some suggestions. Okay, I'll make some suggestions. Okay, well, um, should I go backwards with the slide? Can I make it? No, no, no. No? Okay? Okay. Well, um, in, in this condition, the, most of the cases, they can have congenital heart defects, but... Yes, it does, but Anwar, here are the results. Okay. Look. 
Are you happy? It's 75% of patients, they have congenital heart defects, not all of them. Okay. We go with the next one. One more? Yes. I will learn. Well, a teenager with a history of increased nuchal translucency in the prenatal scan, she has five cast aortic valve, she has a menorrhea, and she's in follow up with the endocrino endocrinologist. What's the most probable diagnosis? So she's, she has shortest stature, amenorrhea, and she has a left sided lesion. She has a bicast aortic valve. I don't think it's allergene because she doesn't have liver problems, so it's not allergene. Here we go. Yes, wonderful. That's cool. That's very nice. Thank you. Uh, may, may I tell about the Turner syndrome? Wait, 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 wait. Uh, at the end of the main session. Now we have to go. Okay. Thank you, Siam. Okay. okay. We have an, another one. Well, in heterotaxy, right arterial isomerism is always associated with asplenia. So do you think that it is right that we call every neonate with right arterial isomerism that he has asplenia and we don't go and check for the spleen? Is it right? But we know that there is a very high variability. It's a bizarre, let's say, laterality defect. Okay, here are the results. Okay. That's are you fine. happy? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Anwar. Can you stop sharing your uh, screen? Please? Yes, sure. Stop sharing. Thank you. Now, Dr. Gad will begin a new presentation. Uh, Gabriel is pediatric medical genetist, medical director of cardiovascular genetic relay hospital for children, associate program director, associate professor of genetics and pediatrics, Indiana University. Okay, can you hear me okay? Very well. Okay, okay great. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our cardiogenetics experience in the Midwest. I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures. And so <clears throat> we're gonna start by talking about some myths and truths about cardiovascular genetics, trying to keep with the title of the session. Then we're gonna go over some ways that you can talk about common genetic tests that are run in this population with families. And then we're gonna spend a lot of the time talking about sort of our Midwestern cardiogenetics program experience. And so just as Anwar said, cardiogenetics, which is a very small section of medical genetics, is um, an overlapping set of these things, but within it, the genetics of congenital heart disease is the most difficult and diverse of the topics. And so uh, it's, it's something that we definitely could spend many, many, many hours, <laughs> maybe days talking about. And so we're gonna sort of focus on the congenital heart disease and the practical aspects of it. And so going into some of those myths and truths, uh, statement one is cardiovascular geneticists do research, they don't see patients. And honestly, this is both a myth and a truth. Um, geneticists who do and specialize in cardiovascular geneticist, genetics are certainly much more likely to be focused on research than the average physician. However, there are ones like myself who focus primarily on clinical care. The next statement is genetics is impractical for patient care in infants with congenital heart disease. Just as Anwar showed, I, I hope that this um, is easily seen as both a myth and a truth because um, there are very practical um, applications for genetics to the care of patients with congenital heart disease. That being said, Geneticists sometimes get in their own bubbles and we can be sort of the epitome of an absent-minded professor. And sometimes we need to sort of be brought back down to earth of this is what's going on with the patient and this is what we need to focus on right now. 
Um, I would be lying if in team meetings before I'd been, I hadn't admitted that I'd been talking about something. And one of the cardiologists sort of was like, L, the kid's on ECMO. Like we need to sort of focus and get back centered to what is most critical to be applied to this patient in this moment. Um, and then the final statement is I consult, think about genetics on infants with critical congenital heart disease when it's appropriate. If you believe you're doing this and it's not every patient, that absolutely is a myth. And hopefully by the end of this um, webinar, you'll, you'll feel that way too. So just spending a little bit of time to going over how we talk about common genetic tests with families. The analogy that I use is that your genome is a library. And within that you have the bookcases, which are like chromosomes. And uh, this is where you can sort of bring in the karyotype analysis of it sort of generally looks over the number of bookcases and the general uh, position of the bookcases. So karyotypes or chromosomal analysis just gives you a big idea of the genomic structure. Um, and it's just uh, growing cells under a microscope. Um, and that's important to know because you need to work with living cells in order to get those metaphase cells. So that sometimes is an issue when you're talking about where you're getting your sample. Karyotypes can uniquely assess for low level mosaic chromosomal conditions and balance translocations. And then going into your genes, they're like books. And so typically when I talk about that, I talk about the chromosomal microarray, which looks at copy number variation on extracted DNA. So this is looking for the missing or extra books and can detect things like 22Q deletion and that sort of thing. So it doesn't see structural differences because you're just looking at ratios of DNA. So that's why in uh, conditions like trisomy 21, we still need to complete that karyotype or chromosomal analysis to ensure we're not dealing with a balanced translocation. And microarray is considered sort of standard first tier evaluation for infants with uh, critical congenital heart disease and really congenital anomalies, autism, developmental delay, the list goes on. This is one of our first go-to tests. And then going into the books, variants are typos. And so if you look at a sentence like this, look at all the bright colors, there's actually a lot of different ways that you could write that and variants of that. And a lot of them actually still make sense, even though they're wrong. And that is true for our DNA as well. We have lots of variants in our DNA across our over 20,000 genes. We have millions of variants and 99.9% .9 of them are benign. And our body reads right through them and knows what they mean. But as we test more genes um, and do more expanded genetic testing on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to be aware that the testing comes back with these with more variants and variants of uncertain significance. And this is one of the many reasons that we're trying to phase out the word mutation from our, um, our vocabulary because mutation is sort of associated with uh, a bad thought in that the, the variant is disease causing when in reality, the majority of our variants and many of the variants reported back on genetic testing may not be disease causing. So that brings us to exome sequencing, which we have a, um, which we use as sort of our first tier on the infants where I am. And so exome sequencing looks at the coding portion of DNA extracted from um, our, our DNA, but the exome, the coding region is actually only 1% of our whole genome. And capturing this DNA, actually it doesn't, it doesn't catch all the genes. There's typically at least a thousand or two genes that aren't fully covered. So it's possible that there are holes in this diagnostically. So that's when uh, geneticists talk about coverage or going back to check the coverage of that gene. That's why we're sort of doing that. And that's why we're trying to get away from whole exome sequencing because it's never really whole. Um, there are always gonna be gaps. The, the part that makes this okay, I guess, is that of those 20,000 genes, we've only associated disease with less than a third of them. So even when we're doing this exome, we're looking at less than a third 
of 1% of our DNA, which when you put that into perspective is crazy that we ever find any answers in, in looking at that little part of us. We also now through bioinformatics can see copy number variants on exome sequencing. So when we say that looking for copy number variation is our standard first tier, we can now say that uh, we can do this through exome and perhaps um, be moving away from array as our first tier. The trick is that this only covers genes. It doesn't cover um, introns. So once again, you can have a diagnostic hole there. A couple other comments on exomes, and I feel the first time you see an exome, you are very much like this lady at the computer, uh, just shocked by what it looks like because there are so many variants. One thing I do with my students is I, I show them my exome and see how many diseases it looks like I have on ClinVar and things like that. It's just a mess. So if you ever have the opportunity to look at raw data, I, I suggest you do because it gives you a greater appreciation for just how frequently there are variants and you become much more comfortable with variants of uncertain significance. But there will be variants of uncertain significance. And if you're gonna work with exomes, you absolutely need a geneticist for variant interpretation backup and for patient phenotyping. In addition, exomes open up the, the possibility of secondary findings, which can be for adult, set on, adult onset conditions like BRCA1 and 2. You're talking to a sleep deprived new parent in the ICU who's overwhelmed and maybe can't even hold their baby. And you're gonna talk to them about adult onset cancer predispositions. This is one of those things where geneticists can get a little too esoteric and, and miss what's in front of them. And uh, so what we tend to do to avoid those conversations and to avoid adding extra stress is we do exome based panels. So we, perhaps a bit paternalistically make some of the, those decisions of right now we're focused on causes for the heart defect and things that will affect them um, in the perioperative period, bleeding disorders, malignant hyperthermia, um, pediatric onset disorders, and, and sort of uh, shield the parents from trying to figure out and, and assess and deal with that excess information. And so that's just sort of a brief overview of how to talk to parents. Now going into the Midwestern Cardiogenetics Program experience. So what is the Midwest? Um, the Midwestern United States is just sort of the hole in the middle. Um, and I realize that a lot of you might not be particularly familiar with it. And, and yes, this is not an accurate map, um, but the places that I've been, uh, I started in, um, I was fortunate to be introduced on how to operate on infants with critical congenital heart disease by watching a tetralogy of below repair with Dr. Michelle Obawi, um, where he let me sit in, like right over his shoulder, basically touching him while he was operating. And that was in Chicago um, between 2010 and 2013. Then I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin until this fall. And then this fall, I transitioned to Riley, which is in Indianapolis, Indiana. So I can't represent the whole Midwest, but at least we have a bit of a tour around of three different, very high functioning centers. Um, all of them have had three star STS ratings and um, all, uh, have been like top 10 uh, US News and World Report centers. So I've been very fortunate to work with great teams. Um, and so some of the things I learned at these locations, in Chicago, I think the first thing I learned is that no one's as organized as they think they are when, they come, when it comes to genetics, unless they have the data to prove it. So um, when I moved to Milwaukee, I was definitely told that, oh yes, we do a raise on everybody. Um, we get genetic consults on everything when it's appropriate. And when you see uh, the data that I'm gonna show, you'll, you'll see that simply isn't the case. So unless you have the data to prove it, I'm not gonna believe that you're doing what you think you're doing. Um, and then the other is protocols because that is really how you 
can make sure that you're doing what you think you're doing is protocolize it so that it's automatic and um, not open for interpretation or error, error. And then in Milwaukee, I really learned that you really have to be part of the team to get appropriate perspective and know when patients change. I've made a lot of diagnoses just by sitting in meetings and hearing uh, an update about a patient during sign out and saying, hey, I need to go back and look at that patient and going back and looking at them, I realized something I didn't realize before. Or with that extra piece of information, I, I realized something I didn't connect before. And so being integrated is really important whenever possible. And it also made me realize that we don't crosstalk across academic lines enough. So I've, I've never been to a formal cardiology meeting other than the ones hosted at my own institution in Milwaukee. And I was sitting in the audience watching speakers who I often spent hours and hours with every day and I had no idea on the work they were doing. So let alone that insight for individuals across the country. And once again, I'm gonna give one example um, in the next few slides that hopefully will help take that point home of we need to be discussing more than we are. So now let's go to a way that we've changed here. We already have done this. And uh, this is for just looking at diagnosis rate um, across three approaches to genetic testing and uh, assessment in infants undergoing surgery at less than a year of age. And this is excluding trisomy 21 because that one's too easy to diagnose. So we just took it out um, of all of these different populations. So this, is, and this data is from Milwaukee. And so our baseline testing when we were, quote, doing arrays on everybody um, was 15%, so 81 out of 525 individuals. And our, um, our result, our uh, rate of array, I think, was, it was less than half. So we certainly weren't doing arrays on all of these individuals. So then we instituted a genetic testing protocol to say, okay, now we're gonna try to do a raise on all of these individuals um, to make sure that we catch them. And when we did that alone, um, we raised the diagnosis rate to 23%. That was just the protocol alone. You'll see that this is only on 115 patients. This is because it was sort of a short time period between when we were just on the protocol and then when the cardiogenetics program started. And so then having sort of protocolized genetic testing and protocolized assessment by a cardiovascular geneticist, our diagnosis rate went up to 32%. So uh, the, we, have, we diagnosed 87 individuals out of 274. We got more diagnoses in about half the sample size than we did in our 525 patients. And so we made a huge difference just by standardizing and having medical geneticist assessment. That being said, as we'll also talk about, there's a limitation to having access to geneticists. And that's an unfortunate reality. So we have to come up with some novel solutions for this to, to make sure our kids are getting the best care. And then just to sort of put a disclaimer on this data, obviously all of these times we're moving forward and with every year there are significant differences in how we, how we look at genetics, access to genetic testing, all of those things. So it's possible that the diagnosis rate was also naturally going up in conjunction with these changes. An additional benefit of the cardiogenetics program is an increased number of dual and incidental diagnoses that were only found because of geneticist assessment. So baseline, looking at those 525 infants in, in the first cohort, there were two dual diagnoses and one incidental diagnosis. And so one of the dual diagnoses was two chromosomal anomalies, both detected on array. And one was a 22Q deletion with um, Cornelia DeLange syndrome. So a complex dual diagnosis that wasn't actually found until age four 
when the child underwent exome because they had not followed the expected course. And our one incidental diagnosis was a diagnosis of hemophilia, which obviously is not a great combination with congenital heart disease, but um, was basically screamed at us by the family because they had this family history. So they told us before the baby was even born that there was this diagnosis. After the cardiogenetics program, so once again, looking at those 274 infants, we found 13 dual diagnoses and 13 incidental diagnoses that altered care. And this was all sort of in the first few months of life, if not the first year of life. So knowing that information is so critically important. And one example I give, partially because it's a little embarrassing and I get to make fun of myself, but partially because it's also important, is a patient we had with heterotaxy who also had oculocutaneous albinism. And uh, the reason it's embarrassing is I did not make that diagnosis clinically. I distinctly remember walking in the room and thinking, the patient was extremely pale and needed a blood transfusion. She was of Scandinavian descent. So in, in my defense, she, she should have been pale, even independent of her uh, albinism. But then when that came back, it was very critical of like, yes, what if this child develops nystagmus? Everybody's going to freak out. She's been on bypass, that sort of thing. And we were able to say, hey, like, let's get an eye exam. If she starts exhibiting signs of nystagmus as we sort of, you know, take her off sedation, those sorts of things, this is what's going on. It's, it's not any new neurologic symptom or anything like that. And provide that level of reassurance that um, hopefully saved um, some interventions and some, some heartache and worry. So early comprehensive diagnostic evaluations and genetics assessment just makes such a big difference and can really help us understand the risks of these genetic conditions so we can mitigate them. And that's where, once again, we get into the genetics is practical and also not practical because so much of this, we don't fully understand the risks. We just know there are risks. And it's only at the highest level centers where they have impeccable outcomes that the genetic effects are really gonna stick out of what they're, what they're sort of, how they're affecting outcome. And we can't really tease that apart unless every patient is assessed systematically. So we have that information comparably on all of our patients and then can look at it. And so we need this information, not only for patient care, but looking into the future of how to make genetics more practical. And so then I want to talk about a project we did last summer that um, is unpublished and has been a bit of a, a casualty of my moving, um, which is why it's not published, but uh, of how we could change care and hopefully really emphasize why we need to, once again, sort of cross those academic lines better. And so this was a project we did looking at 35 infants who underwent Norwood palliation during the duration of the cardiogenetics program. So all of them had had a physical exam in the first few days of life. And we had pictures, because I take pictures of all my patients, and were able to go back and sort of independently confirm this, was, this infant was syndromic based on facial features, this one was not. So of those 35 bifacial features, 13 were syndromic and 22 were non-syndromic. And um, we, we considered heterotaxy syndromic by default, even though frequently their facial features may be relatively reassuring. And so we looked at what were the differences in some of the outcomes um, across these patients. And obviously it's an incredibly small sample size. And this is sort of a, a, a big table, not as big of, as all the data we have, but let's sort of go through what we found um, through some of the more important points, I think. And so the syndromic infants were five times more likely to have a genetic diagnosis, which to me just, I think, means I was doing my job correctly of identifying these features. Syndromic 
infants were ventilated postoperatively for double the time in hours compared on average compared to the non-syndromic infants. The syndromic infants postoperative length of stay on average was a month longer than the non-syndromic infants. And the mortality is defined by the STS database was six times higher in the syndromic infants. Now, obviously, this is really limited by such a small sample size, but we don't have a lot of data on facial features in this population as related to outcomes. So at the very least, I think this data shows we need to take a pause and think about what could we do with this information. And then once again, these are um, just sort of uh, the exact numbers. And you'll see that um, mean length of postoperative ventilation um, and a number with genetic diagnoses were both statistically significant despite the really small sample size. And mortality was actually 0.052, which I was not expecting anything to be remotely significant in this sample size. Um, so I was, I was surprised that our numbers came through um, with anything being significant. And so that brings us back to how could we change care? And so you might say like, that's great that you can look at facial features, but you're in that Midwest and you're not at my center, so that can't help me. Well, actually maybe it can. So working together, we could design novel risk stratifications, for example, using facial recognition software, making it accessible to any child with critical congenital heart disease whose surgeon has a smartphone. Some place where this does get a little um, more problematic specifically for our population is when they're intubated, which a lot of our patients are, and then postoperatively when they're really edematous, because that does make it harder to appreciate those facial features. And that's where some of the human training would need to come in um, into sort of helping stratify these patients. So we could design this by either saying, hey, let's look at the SVR trial and all of these parents have pictures of their kids, good frontal facial pictures. What if we decided to go back and try to get some of those and then put them into the AI like facial recognition software and tried to correlate that just by outcomes? Or what if you got a group of, of people like me and Becky and Anwar, and we reviewed pictures and classified them as syndromic or not syndromic? Prospectively, retrospectively, we could be completely blind to the outcomes and just look through those facial features. And whatever patterns we're seeing, we could train the computer to see. And so this is something that I'm guessing a lot of the cardiologists and, and uh, surgeons and team members who are working had probably had no idea that we're working on facial recognition software and genetics to look for genetic syndromes. So this is one of those things where I think once again, cross talking across, what did you learn at your meeting? What did you, what did you bring home from this is really, really important. And something that I think we need to do better on, which is one of the reasons I've really, really enjoyed these webinars is because I, I don't get to go to cardiology conferences, but I got to see our heterotaxy conference, our hypoplastic left heart conference, and it gives me much more insight as to how I can better apply genetics and how we can come up with extra ideas to try to extend our reach. And so um, going into some of the take home points I really want you to take away, all infants with critical congenital heart disease should have an assessment by a medical geneticist. Unfortunately, this is impossible. Medical geneticists, at least in the US, are, are in short supply. Since our last board exam, there have been a total of 1,762 medical geneticists ever certified in the US. This includes those who are dead and retired. The average age of the practicing medical geneticist in the US right now is over age 50. So this is only going to become a more scarce resource. And looking at our training slot positions in the US, 
less than 30% of our slots filled last year. And this is because people aren't applying to become medical genetics cis. And yeah, we could talk about that. I know you guys aren't interested in that, but we need to come up with ways to extend our reach as not only just medical geneticists, but as cardiovascular geneticists. Because as geneticists, once again, we're covering that whole huge circle. So we're being pulled to patients with inborn errors of metabolism. We're being pulled to these rare diseases that nobody else can care for other than us. Even though congenital heart disease is the most common birth defect, there are other people to care for them and they sort of end up being neglected by us, unfortunately, because we're pulled in so many different directions. So once again, sort of that crosstalk of what's happening between specialties so we can better understand each other and come up with solutions. And then all infants with cr uh, critical congenital heart disease at least should undergo molecular assessment with a chromosomal microarray looking for copy number variants. Um, so at least we should have that going. There are testing protocols that you can put in place to standardize this and ensure that this happens. And I know that I personally have helped um, at least three or four centers institute this at, at their place. So people are willing to help you put this in place and troubleshoot what problems there are. One of them being me. So if you wanna email me about this, I'm happy to help you wherever you are. And then last, once again, we need to figure out a way to work together to get the best genetic care and assessment for these infants because we have limited resources, a lot of patients, and a lot of potential to really, really make a difference. So on that note, I just wanted to give the shout out to the teams that I've worked with to get this data and to learn these lessons because it's so critical to work with them. And so the, the CVICU, the NICU, the cardiothoracic surgery and cardiology and countless others who are part of our, our nursing, um, our heart center teams are really critical to making all of this work. And uh, once again, that communication and teamwork is just so critical. And then, I'm not sure if we have um, a few minutes for questions right now. If not, you can put them in the chat box and I'll, I'll respond to your chat message or we can ask them at the end. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'll Thanks. Share Thanks, Gab Thanks, Gabriel. Great presentation. Uh, we'll see the poll uh, at the end of the last session, okay? Now let's uh, and now let's listen uh, uh, to Dr. Arendt Niklas' presentation. Um, Dr. Niklas uh, is assistant professor of pediatric division of Human Genetics and Metabolism Children Hospital, Philadelphia. Okay, thank you so much for um, letting me participate in this really interesting session today. Um, and I'm really gonna be building on the two previous talks that you heard that provided such a nice discussion and introduction about genetic testing and genetic evaluation in patients with critical congenital heart disease. And the, the population I'm really gonna focus on as an example population today are infants under a year of age with critical congenital heart disease. And I'll be talking through the utility of a genetics evaluation, both a clinical genetics evaluation like Elle was talking about um, and also a lot of the genetic testing that we send. I have no disclosures to report. Um, I don't need to introduce congenital heart disease to this population, obviously, um, but it's important to remember that it's the most common birth defect affecting um, about six to nine out of 1,000 live births and is associated with a very significant morbidity and mortality. Um, if you look at all congenital anomalies in terms of standardized death rate, you can see that congenital um, heart anomalies shown here in red um, are associated with an age standardized death rate of about four and a half um, per 100,000 um, deaths. And so you have to compare that to all the other congenital anomalies that we see, and this really does have a high rate of mortality. But it's important to remember 
that the mortality from congenital heart anomalies may also be associated with some of those syndromic diagnoses that we spoke about and all the other burden of disease that infants with syndromic congenital heart disease suffer from. And so this paper is a wonderful one that was referenced already in an earlier talk, but thinking about this idea of myth versus reality and the question of is congenital heart disease genetic? This has been a discussion and an interesting discussion that's been going on for more than 50 years. This paper was originally um, written in 1968. And it's this beautiful discussion about the genetic environmental interaction that leads to manifestation of congenital heart disease. And they have a, a figure that I still keep on my desk because I think it's a really interesting one to think about, about how this relationship between genetic factors and the environment lead to congenital heart disease. And this idea that you could have a multifactorial um, approach where you end up having um, many risk alleles within an individual, many genes that might have small changes that when interacting with the environment lead to a congenital heart defect. And then you can have different cases where you have a clear chromosomal anomaly or a single gene mutation interacting with the environment leading to congenital heart defects. And even though this was developed in, this picture was written in 1968, we still think about genetics of congenital heart disease very much in this manner. And so we start thinking on many different levels of where a genetic defect or a genetic variant might predispose or lead to congenital heart disease. And so this is really just a reminder based on all the discussions that we've had already about the different types of, of genetic testing that's available. Um, really going from sort of the big picture of a standard karyotype, which was described beautifully, and really does, uh, you can look at a karyotype to look for extra chromosomes or translocations of chromosomes or large deletions or duplications of chromosomes. You're then able to zoom in a little bit more finely using a microarray, which we've referred to a lot already today, which is really able to detect small deletions or duplications. So we always tell families small pieces of DNA missing or extra. And then if you zoom in even further, you start to look at a base pair level. Um, and you can do this with a variety of testing, whether it's targeted gene testing using a next generation sequencing approach or other sequencing approaches, or the newer technologies that we spoke about a lot today, exome sequencing and looking at all the coding regions. And again, it's spell checking those genes or genomic sequencing, which is looking at both the coding regions, the exons and the introns. So we've had a beautiful introduction to this already, but just keep this in mind as we start talking about the yields of different di diagnostic testing approaches. And so this just shows this diagnostic testing approach a slightly different way. Um, if I can minimize this, I apologize. So this is just showing that diagnostic testing platform a variety of different ways, um, going from the SNP array all the way through to next generation sequencing and targeted single base pair analysis through genome and exome, looking for really those, those needles in a haystack. So those coding or splice site variants that might be leading to disease. No. So how useful are arrays? And this is something that um, we're gonna talk about a lot today because this is like we said, our bread and butter first line test um, for congenital heart disease. Um, and we know that there are indeed increased copy number variants in um, de novo copy number variants in individuals with complex congenital heart disease as compared to controls. So if you take a large population of infants or patients with congenital heart disease and you perform microarrays and you just look for new copy number variants, they're enriched in congenital heart disease populations. Um, and previous estimates of how much how enriched these copy number variants are really vary based on the population that you're looking at. And so in one study of about 400 patients from Boston Children's, um, they found a diagnostic yield from all comers coming into their lab of microarrays of about 12.8%. This included both pathogenic copy number variants that you would pick up on a microarray and aneuploides that you would pick up on something like a karyotype, but you can also detect on a, on a array. They also had another 5.8% of patients that had a likely pathogenic copy number variant. So for all comers, it was about a 17 to 18% diagnostic rate of something that looked pathogenic. And this idea of likely pathogenic or variants of uncertain significance, which have even less evidence than a likely pathogenic copy number variant, doesn't take interpretation. This is where bringing in a clinical geneticist to think through, does this fit with the patient's phenotype makes sense. 
This is manifest even in our discussions today on the, on the chat here, where there's been lots of discussions about these variants of uncertain significance and how you think through those. So it's important to keep in mind, it, it does take digging a little deeper and thinking through some of these changes. And so this is just showing a wide spectrum of the diagnostic yields of microarrays from a variety of studies. Um, and as you can see, it, the diagnostic yield spans in that far column from 3% or 2% all the way up to 50% in some populations. And it really has to do with the population that you're looking at. And we know that if you look in populations of patients with a syndromic phenotype, so that have other anomalies, other features on exam, you have a much higher yield and if you compare this directly, um, this going back to that Boston study, amongst all cases, I said they had about a 14.1% diagnosis rate off a microarray um, um, for patients with congenital heart disease. So for all comers, about 14% of this population, they found an answer. But in the patients that just had isolated congenital heart disease who didn't have other features, that diagnostic rate dropped to 4.3%. So there really is a difference in the clinical utility of a microarray in syndromic versus non-syndromic populations. Now, it should be the first-line test, or in most instances, the first-line test for patients with complex congenital heart disease. Um, as I said, we're moving towards exome sequencing a little bit to cover some of those um, to, to be the first-line test in some cases, and we'll talk through that. But even um, even so, as the first line test, it can detect a difference in about 14 to 20% of patients. So it's a useful test to have in, in your repertoire. But we wanted to sort of move beyond that and think what, what, what adds value to a clinical diagnosis or, or a clinical genetics evaluation beyond just a microarray. And so I'm gonna focus really on three questions for the rest of this talk. And, and the first is really, how useful is a clinical genetics evaluation in infants with clinical congenital heart disease? And I'll be talking about a study that we did a number of years ago now, trying to get at that, that question. So when you add everything together, not just the diagnostic testing, but the clinical evaluation by, by a trained geneticist, what's, what's your yield? Um, and then we'll move on to the newer technologies that people are now using at our institution and a lot of other institutions. So both exome and genome sequencing, and we'll be talking about how that increases the likelihood of a diagnosis. And then making finally some comparisons to genetics evaluations in infants with other critical infantile heart disease, such as cardiomyopathy. We have a very high, large population actually of infantile cardiomyopathy at our center. So we had a chance to sort of explore how these approaches can be applied to, to similar disorders and similar groups of patients and sometimes overlapping in terms of their molecular diagnosis as we spoke about earlier today. So first we'll talk about how useful is a clinical genetics evaluation. So this is a, a study that we did a number of years ago, like I said, and it really had three questions that we were trying to answer. So the first is what is the diagnostic yield of a clinical genetics evaluation in infants with congenital heart disease in a cardiac intensive care unit? And what features predict the likelihood of finding a diagnosis? So if you're gonna have a clinical geneticist come see your patient, what features of that patient are associated with the higher likelihood of finding an answer? And then what testing was useful? So this is important to remember, this is an older study that really is in the era before exome sequencing. So this sort of gives a standardized approach or a standardized um, evaluation, at least of our center's approach before implementation of exome. You then have gone on to start thinking about what changes since we've started using exome, and we'll talk about some um, of those features. But unfortunately, exome sequencing isn't available everywhere around the world at this point. So I think it's important to think about the diagnostic yield with exome and without exome. So the study design for this first part of this talk was a, um, basically a retrospective review of every infant seen by the clinical genetic service in our CICU over a five to six year period. Um, again, a while ago now. Um, the records reviewed include all prenatal records, the initial genetics consult note, and then also importantly, all the results from all the other investigations recommended by genetics. And I think this is something important to think about. When we go see a patient, whether it be in an ICU or an outpatient setting, we have associations in our mind as we see a patient to say, oh, if we could look at the eyes or if we could look at the kidneys, this is gonna give us more information about the likelihood of a specific diagnosis. So it's not just genetic testing that we're sending, but it's really full phenotyping that's really important to make a diagnosis in a patient. And that phenotyping of an individual 
often requires other subspecialty evaluations, whether that be looking, as I said, the eyes or hearing or the kidneys or anything else. Um, and those pieces of information sometimes are just as important or equally important as the genetic testing results. And then finally, all of the cardiac um, records, which are clearly important when thinking about infants with um, congenital heart disease. So our study population, um, you had to have been admitted to the CHOP uh, cardiac intensive care unit at less than a year of age within a, cl a clinical genetics evaluation less than a year of age. And you had to obviously have documented congenital heart disease. I think it's important to remember some um, caveats about our study population. So as I was saying, genetics consults were initiated at the request of the CICU team. So this is important because now we have tried to also implement a standardized approach where everybody with congenital heart disease um, is seen by our clinical geneticist. In general, a very high percentage of our, of our um, system is seen, or a lot of high percentage of our patients are seen by clinical genetics. But until you protocolize it, you don't know that that's what's actually happening. Um, Non-dysmorphic infants with cardiomyopathy are not included in this analysis. So this is really focusing on structural heart defects. And then unstable, very premature infants would be, not be included in this because they actually go to our neonatal intensive care unit. So if an infant was born before 35 weeks of age, usually they're not gonna be included in this study, but that's a very small proportion of our patients. So we had 364 patients. Um, they were pretty well sexed matched. They came from a variety of races. Um, their mean age of admission um, was before, it was 0.4 months essentially. And the genetics consultation usually happened in our center at the first day or two that they were in our center. So it happens very quickly. Um, almost everyone had prenatal echoes in our population, which I think is also a very interesting feature um, and might be regionally and, and internationally dependent on your accessibility to prenatal echoes. And prenatal genetic testing was very common in our um, population. Um, postnatal genetic testing was sent on a lot of patients, and then we had a wide variety of different cardiac diagnoses. Overall, of the 364 patients evaluated, we found an answer about 25% of the time. So very similar to the data that Elle was presenting um, from their experience. And I imagine if we protocolize this, we could actually increase, or we have increased our yields. Um, and so 8.5% of our cohort was actually diagnosed prenatally, which tells you a little bit about our demographics and our, and our diagnostic approach in our, in our area geographically. And then 16% were diagnosed postnatally um, as a direct result of the initial genetics consultation. So here's our genetic diagnostic rate by lesion, which is not surprising. Um, and I think that we should keep in mind so our patients with septal or AV canal defects had a much higher diagnosis rate, and this did include infants with trisomy 21. So a number of those kids had trisomy 21. Um, I think it's interesting to see that it, uh, patients with right-sided obstructed lesions had a much lower diagnosis rate off of our standard genetic approach. And, and this is just showing it both as a, as a figure and an odds ratio. So if you zoom in on our biggest population of, of defects or our coronal truncal defects, you are able to see which specific coronal truncal defects had higher diagnosis likelihoods. Um, and again, some of this has to do with a number of the syndromes we've already spoken about today, such as the interrupted aortic arch. Um, I hope you remember and keep in your mind that an interrupted aortic arch, you should have a very high suspicion for 22Q11 microdeletion syndrome. And in fact, um, most of those patients in our cohort did have 22Q. I should say that we're also a big referral center for 22Q11 microdeletion syndrome. So we probably have an overrepresentation of that population in our center. Um, again, also tetralogy of flow um, was associated with a higher likelihood of diagnosis. So common diagnosis by lesion, I've alluded to some of these, but AV canals, most of them were trisomy 21. Conal truncal defects, a lot of them were 22Q11 micro, um, microdeletion syndrome. But interesting, our septal defects, all nine that were diagnosed in our center had a different diagnosis. So there's a lot of variability and things that can lead to, to septal defects. Now, this is what I think is important and sort of highlights some of what's already been discussed today. And we really need to work on developing new ways of, of, of figuring out how to help people identify dysmorphic facial features. Because you can look here that, um, the presence of, of dysmorphic facial features was one of the biggest features that really helped predict a higher uh, likelihood of having a genetic diagnosis. So making tools available, like I was speaking about, um, to be able to identify these features is really important in helping to figure out which infants 
really could benefit from a, a thorough genetics evaluation, even if it's a limited resource in your center. So what are the diagnoses? And this is showing you both prenatally and postnatally. So prenatally, you have to remember that the ma vast majority of the patients that were diagnosed prenatally had either a karyotype or a microarray or both. They did not at this point in time have a lot of targeted gene testing. And so the diagnoses that were picked up made sense that you could pick them up on a karyotype or a microarray. So trisomy 21, Turner syndrome, as we spoke about 22Q, and then other copy number variants. Postnatally, you start to pick up a lot of those other disorders that have diagnostic facial features, for example, that you can see in a postnatal infant, things like charge and Noonan and, and some of the other discussion, um, disorders that we'll talk about a little more. And so then diagnostic yield by test, and these again using a lot of the standard sort of older first line tests um, that we've used. So karyotype was diagnostic in 23% of individuals, um, microarray in our hands was seven point, about 9% diagnostic rate. Um, but we also had additionally 25 arrays that had VUSs. So again, this idea of having to go through variants of uncertain significance and think about whether or not they're pathogenic. And there's a lot of features of a variant of uncertain significance, both on a microarray or on any sort of next generation sequencing type test that you can think about, including some of the things we were talking about on the chat today, was this, was this change inherited from an unaffected parent or is it new in the individual? How common is it in the population? Those types of features can help you start thinking about these variants. Okay. So just to take one moment to go through some of the copy number variants that were detected prenatally. Um, so by far the most common in our hands was 22Q11. Again, postnatally, 22Q, but you can also see some of the other uh, pathogenic copy number variants, um, some of which on 8P23.1, which is important to think about because that's where GATA4 is located, a transcription factor that's really important for patterning of the heart. Um, we also saw Rita Schott patient, uh, Cleve Straw, Williams, as we spoke about. So there's a variety of microdeletion syndromes that can be picked up through microarray. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but I at least wanted to highlight and remind everybody so you can take away the key features of, of the most common diagnoses that we saw. So the most common microdeletion we saw was 22Q11. We've had beautiful discussions of 22Q11 um, microdeletion syndrome. So um, you have to remember it's not just a cardiac lesion, that there's a variety of parts of the body that are very affected, including um, the brain, the, the craniofacial area, the palate, you can have thymus dysfunction, immune system dysfunction, hematologic dysfunction. There's a lot of organ systems and a lot of integrated care that needs to happen. And just showing you again, what was already been highlighted that the facial features of 22Q11 microdeletion syndrome change, but with both ethnicity and age. And so, having some help in terms of gut finding the facial features can be helpful. But just to sort of keep an eye out of some major facial features that you can sort of look at for 22Q, this idea of this asymmetric crying face, this little boy in D is clearly not crying, but he has an asymmetric smile. Um, you can see a lot in the eyes in terms of both an up slanting and a hooding of the eyes. And also the ears are often a, a crucial spot that we look at. So there's some nice reviews out there showing you some of the basic facial features that I think familiarizing yourself with just a little bit um, so that you have that pattern recognition of some of the facial features plus diagnostic or, or common cardiac lesions such as an interrupted aortic arch should raise your red flag that maybe I should think about 22Q. And we talked a lot about the cardiac lesions of this disorder already. So then pathogenic variants that were detected. So these are some of those single nucleotide or a few nucleotide changes that are picked up through next generation sequencing, either using targeted gene sequencing, a multi-gene panel, or nowadays through exome. Um, and the most common postnatal diagnosis that we had with a, a single gene mutation disorder was CHARGE syndrome, which we have not talked about today. So I'm gonna take two seconds to speak about CHARGE. Um, CHARGE is actually an acronym that stands for coloboma, heart disease, coronal atresia, um, growth issues, uh, general urinary anomalies and ear anomalies. And you can see some of the facial features of charge shown here, including um, you can often see signs of a repaired cleft because a lot have cleft lip and palate, um, a broad forehead. And again, the ears are very characteristic for charge syndrome, similar to 22Q where the ears give you a lot of clues into these patients. In terms of the cardio, and like a lot of the other syndromic diagnosis we've talked about, there are obviously a lot of organ systems involved and these kids require multidisciplinary follow-up 
Um, and the cardiovascular malformations that are associated with charge tend to be either conal truncal anomalies or AV canals or aortic arch anomalies. So this is just another one to keep sort of in the back of your mind. Um, and, and it was the one that we saw the most common in our population in terms of single gene disorders. So the conclusions of this first part is really that clinical genetics evaluations of infants with clinical congenital heart disease in the CICU yielded a diagnosis about 25% of the time. Um, and then patients with AV canals and septal defects are more likely to be diagnosed. Um, and diagnostic yields are four times higher in patients with dysmorphic features. So the clinical genetics exams really are important. Thanks, Rebecca. Very interesting presentation. Um, thanks uh, to the speakers and Dr. Agati and all the participants. Uh, the poll. Yes. Uh, can you stop the share, Rebecca? Yeah. Thank you. I can try to stop the share. Yes. There we go. Thank you very much. I, I think that uh, there will be a lot of uh, questions. My idea, if you are okay, we can leave open for a few minutes the chat rather than to go with the poll, or we can try one or two poll for each, because I saw that in the chat there is a lot of uh, movements and uh, I think that we can give opportunity. I saw that uh, Gabriele is giving the email, Anwar is doing the same. I think that this was the first, the starting events about cardiogenetics and I'm sure we start from the right way because the, uh, the, the approach must come completely from cardiogenic side, from genetics, completely from pediatric cardiology and uh, trying to keep uh, the experience together according to what I think is very important is the clinical impact of uh, each uh, uh, genetic disorders for all the patients who are going. Of course, as cardiac surgeon, we are very, I told you before in the broadcast, uh, very interested about this. So I think that uh, this was uh, amazing. It's uh, not the right word, it's more than amazing because uh, we have a lot of people from around the world during the, paper, the preparation of this uh, webinar. We met people from Africa, from other countries, where these things, the diagnosis is not still possible. So Congenital Art Academy wants to try to keep, as you say, and also Gabriel say about the fact that uh, you can make uh, a, an application of the people can have uh, diagnostic uh, you know, suspicion of some, uh, of, uh, some uh, genetic disorders. At the same time, I think that is very important that, uh, as you say, we have a bit to change the language of genetics and we have to change a bit the approach of uh, the clinicians. They must work more together trying to keep the same language that is uh, not easy. So this is my, my, I know, you know, Gabriel, we did talk about this and uh, this was the starting point. And when we found the, the experience from Rebecca, we say that uh, this uh, can come, of course, in clinical, uh, must come in clinical practice. And uh, at the same time, we discussed with Grace, we have a very big group of researchers in a congenital art academy, there are people interested in research. And I'm sure that, of course, we cannot think to do a perfect genetic test to child from Africa or different country, but we can start to help sharing what do we do when the genetic syndrome is confirmed. And Anwar, she, in Rome, we are using a, a protocol for antibiotics according to what is the main diagnosis of the genetic disorder. So again, there is a, a lot of things. I'm sure this was the, the first step in a, in a good way. And uh, we have some uh, delegates from, one is uh, Gopi Nalayan from India, if you have question. And uh, there is uh, our, uh, our delegates uh, from the Gulf, uh, that uh, I don't know, she has to say, to ask something. Are you okay? Thank you very much for such an interesting um, presentation. My question goes to Rebecca at the end for prenatal diagnosis. Now, 
if you go for prenatal genetic testing, what will be the test as for? You, you, I, I didn't get this quietly. Is it microarray and chromosomes or um, this is the standard? What about the uh, other ones? Like uh, if we do NIPT and you want extended NIPT, what, what do we tell the parents? Because I'm, I'm a, pedi a pediatric and pediatric cardiologist. So what will I ask for if I find a congenital heart disease in general, it doesn't have to be a, a, a truncus or a VSD or anything. Um, what do what test do I ask for, and how valuable this test, and what's the relation to this available test to the NIPT? Thank you. Yeah, so it's a good question. So the, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with NIPT that she's referring to. So NIPT or cell-free DNA-based testing is really was developed originally um, to look using a blood spot or a blood draw from the mother for circulating fragments of DNA from the fetus to look for aneuploidy. So to look for trisomies 21, 18, and 13. Some companies are now calling off uh, microdeletion syndromes from that, that sample. So it really depends on the laboratory you're using and the validity of the testing for different things that they call off. So some samples or some companies are calling off 22Q pretty regularly, and that tends to be the one that's the most commonly called off from um, NIPT testing. Um, and some are doing even more than that in terms of micro deletions. So you have to look at the fine print of the NIPT company that you're using. Now, a diagnostic test would have to come through either a CVS, a choroid villus sampling, or an amniocentesis. Mm. And you have samples that you can then do further diagnostic testing off of. And again, you can do a karyotype, a microarray, or targeted gene sequencing now for known um, genetic changes. So for example, if we have an infant that we suspect has Noonan syndrome, we will send a multi-gene Noonan panel off of that testing. And what I didn't get to talk to a little bit in our talk today, because we ran out of time, is that there's now a push to doing some degree of exome sequencing, mostly in a research setting, but it's moving towards a clinical setting off of those samples from infants um, that identify, or fetuses identified in utero to have congenital heart disease or other defects. In utero, the ones you've done, the prenatal genetic testing, what did you do? Was it, uh, was it fetal DNA or was it annio and CVS? What was it? Yeah, so we try to really go with, with amniocentesis or CVS-based testing um, and using microarray um, and then targeted gene sequencing for things that we're suspicious of, or if there's a known family history and the family hasn't chosen to do pre-implantation testing. So the, we, those are those are diagnostic tests. That being said, most a lot of families choose not to do that. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. No, no, wait. Samak, uh, Samak, sorry. Samak, okay. sorry. Sorry, wait a moment. We have uh, Gopinala. You already used your time. Wait a moment. Sorry, we have one colleague from India, and uh, no, no, they, they... I would like to tell. I would like to tell about the uh, uh, tell detection, of the, detection of the deletion in the uh, cell-free DNA, according to the lecture of the professor. Gopi. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good, good evening. It was a very nice presentation by Rebecca, Gabriela, and Anwar. I have learned a lot from you all because as a surgeon, we are almost interested in a, a genetics because post-operative care most depend upon the genetic, as you told, the post-operative ventilation time and uh, response. So it's nice initiative by Sasa and Grace through the Congenital Heart Academy to bring us together and so that we can have Mingilu Chitadara and uh, do good to the patients, to the society, and improve the results of the patient. That's a very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Professor, now it's your it's your moment. Hello. Jamak. Uh, yes. 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 I, uh, sorry. Yes, sorry, uh, sorry to disrupt, uh, but I, I would like to tell you, uh, NIPT test is useful, but only for, uh, with, with high accuracy for 21 trisomy. As you know, 18, trisomy 18, trisomy 30, the accuracy is lesser, uh, less than 21. Mm -hmm. 
On the other hand, if we would like to check to, uh, other deletion duplication by NIPT, the accuracy is less than 16 per 60 percent. So, as yeah. the professor told us, it's better to do amniocentesis and uh, uh, and check by the array. But uh, it's very important uh, during the first trimester, uh, 11 to 13, according to the diagram, check the NT. Most of the country, if they not call uh, to more than 2.5 centimeter, but in other country, three centimeter is very, uh, it should be very accurate to uh, detection the congenital heart disorder. So uh, I would like to tell you NIPT, it's not correct way to detection any congenital heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is some comments, Anwar. I just uh, wanted to say quickly, yes. sorry, that um, I put a link in the comments section. The National Institutes of Health has a um, genetics in diverse populations project that's run by a cardiovascular geneticist, Dr. Max Minke. And I, I don't actually know his current funding situation or what he's doing, but he's specifically interested in expanding our genetics knowledge in, in populations that don't have resources that we haven't had great representation from before. So he might be someone for those of, those of the uh, attendees who are asking for research contacts. I think he might be a really good one to look up. Yes, thank you, yes. Gabriela. It's okay if we share in our social media this information or we should talk to him before. Uh, we should probably email him first, but I, I'm sure he wouldn't mind. <laughs> Spread the news. This is something that would be helpful for a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. Rebecca, you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to second that I think that's a great sort resource. And also going back to the NIPT, I think it's important to remember it's a screening test. It's a very good screening test for certain things like trisomy 21, but it's not a diagnostic test. And so we harp on that a little bit as geneticists, and we really believe that getting a sample from an amnio or a CVS or postnatally is really what is gonna make the diagnosis. Um, and it's important to read the fine print of any test, but especially NIPT, because its accuracy varies a lot by diagnosis. So Sasha, now we can I say, sorry. Oh, I just wanna answer uh, Rebecca. I, I mean, as fetal cardiologists and as, as cardiologists, obstetricians, they all know that NIPT is screening and they have to do other things. But now what's coming up in the market is the fish and they're trying to do better and better. So, so do you believe in the accuracy of the fish one, the extended NIPT looking for the fish, which is 22Q, or as geneticists, you doubt what's going on? I think it's not a perfect test. I think we need much larger populations to, to show the true accuracy and much more experience using these test modalities. Um, and again, it's, it's, it all, it's all to some degree computationally derived from a sample that you're trying to purify from mom. And so it's important to remember that testing the primary tissue from the infant is important. Thank you. Okay. So I think that uh, we are done. We spend more grace uh, will kill us because it was very out of limits, but science doesn't have, uh, no, no, that science doesn't have limits, uh, no problem. It was and really amazing, it was really amazing. It was worth uh, uh, listening to all of you. Thank you very, very much. We really appreciate. Okay, so bye from Italy and uh, to all of us. Please, from bye, Rome. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Hi, Gabriel, thank you. So the promise, we finish with the promise. We can make a research on uh, this, uh, all this field together. We will launch in our delegates uh, with uh, Gopi also in India. We will try to do our best. And uh, I hope you will coordinate with uh, with Anwar, with all the yes, stuff. Yes, of course. I know that it's not easy, but at least we try. And we can try. We must try. Yeah.
Yeah, and if Grace is around, you are in trouble because she can send you 100 email in uh, one hour. So no problem. <laughs> That's good. I thanks to Dr. Uh, Saber. Thanks to, uh, to be as a panelist and uh, thanks uh, Rima to be with us. I it's my pleasure. We'll see all of you on uh, Thursday. Correct, Grace. This is your time. Oh, so see everybody on Thursday, the Thanks. same time, 3 p.m. Rome time, to talk about cardiac anesthesia. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Have a good day. Thank you. Welcome. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Rima. Bye. I want a pizza from you. Pizza. We love. <laughs> Pizza is not a problem. <laughs> well, a proper pizza from Italy, not the one we have here. Yes. Okay. Thank That's you, okay. Mr. Thank you. Gopi, how is it? Yeah, is it okay? yeah fine. Yeah. How is the program? Is working well? No, it's like COVID. Because of COVID, there was some interference. So yeah. hopefully, in the next two, three months, it'll pick up the program. Okay. Right. Good night. Regards to your wife. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Please. Bye. Thank you very much.